Welcome viewers to our ongoing program focus coming to you from Burlington, Vermont, from Town Meeting TV, from Center for Media and Democracy. We are going through the pandemic and we are sequestered in our homes at this time for this program via Zoom. I am your host, Margaret Harrington for Focus and the, the topic or the title of our show is Fomite Press, be careful what you wish for. And I have the, the, my uh, guests here, my wonderful guests who are returning for a second time to focus. And it's Donna Bister and Mark Estrin, the, uh, the co-founders of Fomite Press and the publishers of Fomite Press. Welcome Donna and welcome Mark. Hey. Thanks. <laughs> so happy and when it seems thank you so much for inviting us into your home and uh, it's wonderful to see you there and, and and looking well too as as we go through this pandemic and um so first of all uh can you bring us up to speed on what fulmite press is doing right now uh working hard at bringing out new books we have um in our previous lineup, we have 193 titles out already and another 40 in production right now of all sorts, um, graphic work, um, poetry, novels, short stories, and the category that we call odd birds, which is anything else, including a lot of work by uh, Peter Schumann of Bread and Puppet Theater. Wonderful. And of course, yeah. If the tech works, I can just take you on a flash trip through the titles that we're showing and working on right now. If I can share a screen with Okay, you. we'd love that. Um, okay, so can you, you see this? Yes. This, this is our books that are currently published. And there are so many that all I wanna do is show you how ridiculous it is how many books we have when i do this i can't believe it uh, <laughs> you know they just go on and on and on and you know I, uh, considering that we started with the idea of of just a joke you know can we can we can we publish anything uh this has become this is the beware of what you wish for uh, aspect of it because it does go on and on and on and on and we've done all those things and they're out and they were uh, for sale and sold and um, they exist in the world and I can't believe it and anyway when we get to the end of this we haven't come to the end because then we also have <laughs> forthcoming books and here are all the books that are sort of uh, in process now that aren't out on the market yet. So this is a whole but, other- But will be out soon. We'll They're the out. ones that are almost ready, so. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, that's that's the answer okay, uh, the, to the question. Oh, uh, this is, is beautiful and wonderful. And, and let's, let's, uh, let's keep the books up on the screen too, or if possible, uh, it's it's just amazing. Congratulations! It's so great. Thank you. So, well, yes, but uh, it's it's you started in 2011, correct? Right. And as Mark says, it was a little bit of a joke. We had both been going to um, readings at the Firehouse Center once a month. Authors would just get together and read from works, and it was open reading. Anybody could come, and um, we both were taken by a novel in progress that uh, Roger Coleman from Burlington was reading and thought, this mm. needs to be published. And and this needs to be published and, and this needs to be published. And <laughs> Jesus, somebody should publish this. And so <laughs> we, we investigated what options there were. I mean, at that time, self-publishing was just kind of coming into its own. And self-publishing meaning, uh, not Random House and Simon and Schuster, you know, that you could do it yourself if you wanted to, and you could even make yourself into a publishing company. And yeah. so um, 
we had had a previous little publishing adventure called the Old North End Rag which was a neighborhood newspaper that we did for four or five years in the late 90s, early 2000s. And our partner in that, that project was Ron Jacobs. And when we mentioned publishing to him, he said, oh, I have a manuscript. <laughs> and so we used him as a guinea pig. And <laughs> um, this is the book. We got it back and said, darn, looks like a real book. Yeah. It, it, it even has words it inside. It even has words inside. I mean, it, it really, it looks good. You, can, you know, you can see it, it looks like a regular book. Up. You can read it, it's, um, it's in English. It has <laughs> punctuation and diction. And, and we were working with very simple tools, um, a word processing program and I think maybe Photoshop elements, like very simple tools. Um, and came up with something that looked pretty professional. So we solicited a few more manuscripts from friends that we knew were good writers. From these groups, starting with the people that we knew from the reading groups in Burlington and Flynn Avenue. And, uh, yeah. and well, and like Barry Goldens yeah. and friends from- Goddard writers from the old days. And, and by the end of the year, we had 10 or 11 books on our bookshelf. That's amazing. And the process of it, Donna, where uh, you, did, did you do it all in your home or did you send it out for? Well, uh, the, the, the print, we use a print on demand publishing process. And there are lots of companies that do print on demand. But when we started out, there was something called Create Space which allowed you to just upload a, a PDF file for the book and a PDF file for the cover, and they'd send you back a book mm. um, free, except for the printing cost. And then they had a distribution system that was mostly Amazon, but would um, sell to bookstores too. And so we don't have to do any of the distribution of books because that's beyond us. <laughs> Um, we work, I mean, you are looking at the Fomite office. This is it. Um, there's an upstairs annex where I have my computer, but this is where uh, Mark does all the editing and um, that kind of work. Right. There, there are now a lot of other companies that do that, um, including one that's run by Ingram, which is the major wholesaler for independent bookstores. And we've moved a lot of our work off the Amazon Create Space platform over to Ingram because it's friendlier um, to a larger number of bookstores. And um, it's, there are a lot of people also that don't want to deal with Amazon. Right. So right. politically. And, yeah, politically. And that, but well, yes, go on, go on. Well, I mean, and that, you know, we like to think of this as a uh, post-capitalist press, but the fact is we're in bed with the biggest capitalist of them all, yeah. uh, which is a contradiction, uh, you know, a, a basic uh, existential con contradiction of trying to do anything in this society, right? So the other piece of what we were trying to do was, um, as we're publishing books, trying to do, uh, make a business that put the authors first, so. Well, and the basic principle of the business is to not make money. For us. Not make money. Make no money. For the business. For the business or for us. That's um, why we thought it was post-capitalist. Right. Uh, so the way our, our process works is that, um, we don't take a salary or anything for that for our work. We just do it as political work. And the process that we use doesn't cost anything other than labor until a book is actually printed. And in the print on demand system, it's not printed until somebody buys it. So if someone um, say clicks on the Crow Books website and orders a Fomite book, the order goes out across the internet and to the printer in Tennessee or somewhere, and it gets printed and then shipped 
directly to the person from there. Um, and then that money that the person paid for the book um, comes, some portion of that comes back to us in royalties and we give most of it back to the authors at the end of a, the royalty period. So our- right, Because you have uh, expenses, right? I mean, you would need that- They're small though. Yeah. You know, we, we, we each have a computer, we have a website. We, um, we own our house. So we don't have, the, the, the Fomite business doesn't have to pay to support us, but we like the business to support itself um, to break even, which it does. And also we, most, I think most, we, we also ask our, our authors to contribute their royalties um, to do Doctors Without Borders, and many of them do. So, you know, the cash, sort of avoids us by plan and uh, winds up in, in the right places and not in the wrong places. Mm. What, what about any, uh, do you have to pay Amazon or Ingram anything at all? <laughs> <Amazon>. they, <laughs> they, take a, uh, they take a percentage of the sales. They pay themselves. They pay themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. And- uh, Off the top. Yeah, and top. it's, so on a book that is, you know, a hundred pages long, say that's a pretty skinny poetry book. It costs mm -hmm. about three dollars to print. And those mm -hmm. are the kind of books you buy for fifteen dollars, and you know. So the difference between that printing cost plus a small percentage that Ingram or Amazon keeps for their non-printing expenses, the rest goes to the most of the rest goes to the author. Mm. Um, I was going to say something else about the business side, but I don't really remember what it was. So. I want well, to say I... something about the joke side, it, um, starting as a joke. Oh, yeah. Um, that here we are with the possibility of having a publishing company after we publish one book, uh, if we want to do some more, because there, it obviously works, the system works. We have people offering manuscripts. So are we a company? Oh, we're a publishing company. What, to, what do we call it? What's its name? You know. So I had, I don't remember when, 10 years ago now, written a book um, called The Annotated Nose. And The Annotated Nose was not, you know, this is a shtick, but it is written by a guy named William Hundwasser. And I was just the editor of this <laughs> Hundwasser book. And yeah. then the, the character in the book contributed all these notes, uh, calling Hundwasser a liar and telling the real story. So there was, you know, there was uh, Hundwasser's novel over here and the character's notes over here. And I have some editorial notes. So it was that kind of a funny book, you know, uh, but the publisher, we needed a name for the publisher who published Hundfasser's book here. And uh, I don't remember how the word first came about, but I mean, my daughter's a doctor and uh, I don't know, and I was a PA, the word fomite, uh, not everybody knows what that means. Fomite is anything, any surface on which you can spread uh, or microorganisms like this here, that's a fomite. Touch this, I got them on in my hands, you know. Great, great. Uh, so everything's a fomite, doorknobs, doctors ties in hospitals. And that, that's why they're always washing because everything they touch is a fomite. And, the, and so the, the company in this book that, that published um, Hundwasser's book is, uh, we called it fomite, fomite press because of, this is a book about the plague and all of that. Talk but, about the plague. We're going through something like a plague, right? I well, mean, so the, now I, I have a, you, a, a Google oh. alert for Fomite so I can see when there, something comes up about the press. But because of the pandemic, all I'm getting are CDC warnings about doorknobs because <laughs> they're Fomites. So, um, <laughs> And the, ne the next movie I'm going to watch is Contagion. 
Oh, <laughs> from 2011. Uh-huh. And Fomite, see, it seems, I haven't watched it yet, but Fomite seems to uh, figure in it. It so, does, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and after having thought about Fomite as an image, uh, it becomes clear that a book or a printed page clearly is a fomite for psychic organisms and that the author plants a psychic organism on a page and the reader you know, strikes the page with his eyes and, and a disease is transferred, uh, which is the disease of the author's thought. Uh, is now contagious and so that and in fact you know there's a nice we have I don't know where it is on our card somewhere a nice little quote from Tolstoy about uh, how uh, the function of art is to um, you know how that goes. No, I, I have it right here in front of me let, let me read it. Yeah. The capacity of art is based on the capacity of people to be infected by the Feelings of Others by Leo Tolstoy. Okay, so yeah. we, didn't, we didn't tell Tolstoy to write that, <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> but we collected it. We, we, we grabbed it for the back <laughs> of our card. Yeah. Is, uh, <laughs> oh, I, I will. I, but the use of the words disease and infection in a positive sense is it makes my hair stand on end almost, you know. So, but it's true. <laughs> well, you know, it's true like that. Um, but, you know, more, more, it's a tr- tr- treatment, it's a subject that has been treated at depth and depth, especially in German rom- rom- romantic literature, art as disease. Thomas Mann, who's one of my favorite authors, this is one of his major themes, art as disease. Uh, the diseased consciousness that produces a non-normal uh, substances, which is which becomes art. You know, uh, the average shoe salesman in the role of a shoe salesman does not produce art unless he becomes sick and he quits, and then he starts becoming a novelist, you know, or a painter, or a violin player. So. Art and disease is is a big topic. Hmm. Is it is it a topic in any of the books that you published in in the last few years? I'd say all of them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, maybe that's an approximation, mm. but it's hard to get away from uh, the. I, if if my, look, we have very um, there's a role breakdown here. I mean, I get to I get to pick all the books because I am the entire uh, acquisitions committee. Donna gets to make all the books. I have no idea how she makes them, but <laughs> what she makes is what I have worked on with an author chosen chosen to work with the author, and then I send to her, and and then she takes it over from there. I have no idea what she does, and if she went away, there would be no fomite. And if he went away, there would be no fomite. Because... Well, because only because you wouldn't want to pick the books. Right. So, exactly. So, uh, but, you know, we do serious books. Um, and w- there's a lot of categories uh, that are called genre books. That we don't do at all. You know, uh, and and what what is a serious book? Well, there's a great range of serious books, but, you know, most of them, uh, deal with situations in tension and conflict. And that in itself is disease because, uh, you know, you take a, a person, a character who is in trouble in the environment in some way against the environment being pulled or uh, pulled apart in the relationships or whatever, you have disease, you know. And if you don't have disease, then you probably don't have a book. Uh, that's an overgeneralization, um, but well, to, Mark, for a moment, talk. I was surprised about that Charles, a book by Charles Simpson, because I did I I know him here in Burlington as an activist, but I didn't know that he was a novelist also. Well, I didn't and, either. You know, uh, one day there just comes in. This is how it comes: submission, right? 
submission. Uh, are you interested in, uh, I have I have a dot and I have a, a book of poems, I have a whatever, and I get something from Charles, you know, and he says, uh, you want to look at my novel? Well, what's my novel? Well, I have a 500 page novel that I've read, <laughs> you know, and I've known Charles for years and we're in the same sort of discussion group and I've never known he was a novelist. And, uh, and then he not only was a novelist, but he wrote a considerable novel. Um, and so, yes, uh, uh, I was as surprised as you were, but the fact is that the intelligence that he generally, and an, an analytical ability, he's a professor, as the, was a tenured professor of sociology uh, at, um, across the lake, SUNY Plattsburgh, SUNY Plattsburgh mm -hmm. and has taken students a lot down into uh, Central America and Mexico um, and is, uh, has wrote a book about the predatory um, corporations that are working on seed term terminating seeds and have their laboratories and uh, plots, you know, experimental farm plots down there and the violence that comes with them and the, pl and the plotting and the international uh, shenanigans. He knows all about that stuff. And uh, that also surprised me because, you know, that, that isn't, again, what we talk about in our discussion group is usually, you know, what to do with the pit in Burlington. Or right, right. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> the whole subject that, you know, landed on us uh, and, like a ton from the sky was Charles's book. Yeah. You know, had to, so, you know, do the things. Yeah, when I read, when I saw what the book was about, you know, just now when I was looking at, it, at, the, at the information on, on your website, I thought of the, uh, of those seeds that have been in Vermont that where the farmers have to return the seeds to the company. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Right, they're not allowed to replant them. They're not allowed to, to replant. save the seeds and plant them again. Well, and the way you do that more easily, you know, take the, is simply they'll only, they'll only grow once and the seeds that come out of the plant are sterile. That's what's, right. So there, there are both both kinds of um, the the seeds that are can't be used again by contract, and the seeds that just won't work. Uh, but it's part of the same project uh, to get yeah. farmers to need to buy new seed every year. Yeah, yeah and then it, the, one of the nice things, nicer parts, and in fact one of the few parts where Don and I actually work together on something. Uh, is the covers, the book covers. <laughs> and uh, the, the Charles's cover is terrific. And, um, you know, it's just stuff we landed on. I don't know if you have, do we have a Charles here? Uh, only upstairs. No. Well, yes, but, but Kevin, Kevin Harms, who was our technician on the show and director, he will be able to show that right, right on the screen now. I'm trying to find it here in front of me, but I, I can't access it myself. Uh, right to go to our website and um, uh, click on our books and then go to Simpson, you know, by author or something. Well, it's near it, the top because it's, it's, it's recent. A, yeah, it's called an Uncertain Harvest. Uh, you can well, see, but anyway, it's a beautiful, beautiful uh, Peter Bruegel uh, harvest scene. Um, and it's just in itself such a um, uh, the distance between the authenticity of that and the corrupt nature of contemporary uh, agriculture you know for uh, industrial agriculture the the fundamentalness of these people there with their sides and trying to drink out of you know get some of the thirst gone and you know the it, it just is a wonderful, wonderful contrast. I wanted to put a, uh, a little tiny uh, combine in the distance 
coming up the road <laughs> toward toward them. <laughs> we couldn't do it. And Donna thought it was tacky anyway. I did try <laughs> it, but it, it was tacky. You took it out. So I mean, the Bruegel is uh, enough itself to make a comment on the contents of the book. Yes. Mm, wonderful. And uh, what? And then tell me more about the process of you publish the book, and then they are available online from Amazon Ingram, and they have ISBN numbers, right? Correct. Um, they so they, they have ISBN numbers and most of them also have Library of Congress numbers. So their cataloging is all automatic through the Library of Congress. Um, although most people buy our books online, uh, bookstores can order them um, through their normal wholesale channels. Um, so if you want to buy a book through a bookstore, you, it may not be on the shelf, but you just go in and say, I'd like this book. And three days later or two days later, it's there because the regular distribution channels and you can buy it through uh, an indie bookstore and not have to buy it through Amazon. Mm -hmm. And we also produce most of our books as eBooks. So if you have a Kindle or a Nook or some other kind of e-reader, you can buy it that way too. Okay, well then, how does that work, Donna and Mark, that you, you just mentioned something to me that I really, I didn't know about it, that all of your books are available as ebooks too. I, I them, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. There are lots of ebook sellers. I mean, Amazon has a separate site, separate part of their website for Kindle books. So if you look up Charles's book on Amazon, you'll see uh, page for paperback and a page for Kindle. Or a link for paperback. Yeah. And the same on Barnes and Noble, there's a print page and a Nook page. Um, and through that ebook uh, process, we can make all our books available to public libraries. And one of our principles is that um, we make it available to a library at the same price as we make it available to an individual. And that's quite different than most publishers. Um, and in fact, on the ebook publishing sites, they say, set your library price here, make it a lot higher, because it's going to be borrowed over and over again. But we don't do that. We want um, library patrons to be able to, to have our books. Um, and libraries to, and be, libraries able to, buy to them. be able to buy them without big, breaking the bank. Yeah, you know? big pressure on library. Uh, um, resources now so. but how does that work do that do you uh does the does the uh the uh person have to go in to request the book at the library before the library will will uh get a copy or do, do you have a system where the libraries automatically or not automatically but choose to to uh have the the fomite books on the shelf the books are listed in the all the places that libraries buy them from, but generally like a lot of books, um, unless it's a bestseller or a hot genre, a library is not gonna buy it unless a patron requests it. Um, and then they do buy it. And then they do usually. I mean, uh, Fletcher seems to have all my books. I have 15 novels. They're, they're there on the shelf. Yeah. Um, but 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 Marco, your all your books were not published by Fomite, right? They no, were... no, 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 no. Uh, uh, Twelve, thirteen were published before we start, or are still not. The last one was not published by Fomite. You know? Yeah. I just uh, it's nice to keep up your other publisher relationships. So generally speaking, libraries order our books if they're contacted by someone about that and. Um, we have one author in the greater Boston area who's doing a big library push. And as soon as she's done, her second book is coming out in June of this year. Um, she's going to do a little, either a newsletter article or a little Zoom class for other Fomite authors about how you, what works in approaching libraries and getting them to stock your, your book on the shelf. Right. So, um, and also get, getting the word out with reviews too. I mean, how, how uh, 
do you get, do Fomite authors get their books reviewed in, in different publications, Some beginning with the New York Times book review? Yeah. And, oh. <laughs> so. um, no, but there, there are review sites that are friendlier to independently published books. So forward reviews, Kirkus reviews, Publishers Weekly off and on, Library Journal off and on. And then there are hundreds of book bloggers. And um, many of our authors go that route. So they will research which book review blogs um, are interested in the kind of book that they write. And then they'll pitch their book to that reviewer. And many of our books get reviews. Some of our authors don't care about that. They don't care about reviews. They don't care about prizes. They don't blurbs. They don't care about blurbs from other authors. They just want their book out there. And and then they every author has his or her own uh, mailing list of friends and colleagues and um, people that uh, they work with in other areas uh, beyond their particular area. And so they are capable of announcing the book. And in theory, everything should grow geometrically. You know, you send it to two people and those two people send it to two people. It doesn't work that way, but uh, it, does, it does grow. It's not, the, it's not a, no, nothing is a corpse. <laughs> and it's, and it uh, also hangs around. Well, you know, the thing is you publish a new book. I have this as an author. You publish a book, it gets attention for six weeks, and then there are other books. Bye bye, you're done, right? right. We, we yeah. did you. Uh, <laughs> but the thing, uh, and then things, at least in the old days, simply went out of print. But nothing ever goes out of print anymore, which is, I think, terrific. Yeah. So, yeah. Because... But, but, but wait a minute, Ed. when you say, Mark, nothing ever goes out of print anymore, what do you mean by that? When you write a book, uh, it's printed. Um, the file continues to exist. We have the files of all the books uh, that have that we've done. The the places that have reviewed them, or uh, I don't. You know, it's just the um, until electrons go away. Those electrons, that arrangement of electrons will exist. I think I, I have a different way of explaining it. And that is in the in traditional publishing, there's a print run. And it's, say, 10,000 books. Mm -hmm. and those are sold, they either reprint another 10,000, or they don't. And if they don't, then that first group of books is all there are, and they circulate through used book sales and whatever's left in bookstores. For print on demand, the book only exists as a file until someone buys it or until we take it down. Um, which, you know, if we were to cease to exist, we, our books would probably get taken down at some point. Um, but they don't have to. So as long as someone orders it, it's in print. You know, Donna says the, you have a print run of 10,000, but <laughs> you know, not for literary fiction, which is what we publish. No, they have print runs of 250. Right. I mean, the, the, the stuff in the four and five and six figures for print runs, that ain't what we do. You know. Yes, and in fact, our best seller has sold about 1,200 copies. Um, and that's the way it is. It isn't because we're bad or the, it's bad or anything. It's just that the different... You know, if you want to write a romance novel, you can sell a lot more copies. Right. You want to write a complex, uh, intellectually uh, sincere and authentic in investigation of the problems of uh, living in the world. Well, who needs that? <laughs> you know. And also in the context of this time, where everything seems to be online. I mean, not only people's private thoughts and, and uh, musings and you know, put out in a, in a few characters or whatever, 
and then uh, looked at by anybody who wants to, uh, the, the printed word as, as, we, as we remember it, or I remember it from my childhood of the book in the hand, uh, now it's more of a, of a treasured object than it ever was. You know, the, the difference between the ebook and, and the, the actual book in, in your hand. I have the book Industrial Oz here from you. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. With the, the nuclear, with the nuclear uh, poems in it, which anti-nuclear poems, which I cherish. But it's very different to have this book right here with me than to see it online. And uh, so with, with you're going, you're going actually going, even though you are revolutionaries in your in your sphere you're you're going with the flow it seems i'll tell you something i mean i'm one of the greatest fans of ebooks first of all there's no more room to put books we don't have any more room on the bookshelves second mm -hmm. of all half of the books that i would pull out of the, sh the sh these shelves that you can see make me wheeze um because <laughs> paper deteriorates <laughs> over time <laughs> And, yeah. and I have to, and then I go online and I look for an electronic version and, and order it. Right? <laughs> Third of all, you're lying in bed at night. It's cold. You want the covers <laughs> open, you're holding the book up. You want to hold a 400 page book up like that. Try to keep the pages open. Try to turn the pages with one hand uh, and then have it fall down on your wife's face. <laughs> <laughs> It's so much better to read a Kindle at night or, um, you know, you press, you, you can hold it, it's light. You can turn the pages with one finger. Da, 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 da. I love it. It gets tired at night. You want to, you wake up, you want to read at three o'clock in the morning, but your eyes are, saying, you make the print bigger. Right. right. Yeah. So <laughs> for, geez, for geezers, I'll tell you, it's terrific. Yeah. But we have no intention of giving up the print book. That's for sure, because one of our uh, promises to our authors is that we'll make a beautiful object for them. Right. Um, well, on that note, and, and in fact, it, it, they are a, a beautiful object and they are beautiful objects. And then what they transport to our interior is also beautiful in, in the uh, reception that we have of of new knowledge, experience, and the Tolstoy phrase, the feelings of others. So on that, I'd like you to, um, to come back again another time. <laughs> do a third, we'll do a third time at some point. If, if, we re if you remember things that we, we didn't cover now that you wanted to. And uh, for one thing, I hope that this spreads the word about Fomite Press. On, from Channel 17, uh, Center for Media and Democracy. But I have one, one last question here because I had, have not lived in Burlington that very, very long. I've lived in Vermont for a little while, but not, not in Burlington. But I heard from my daughter that there used to be a, a nose running around town. Is that so? Was there a nose that was running around town and uh, that... Uh, I wrote a book called The Annotated Nose, and uh, Gogol wrote a book called a story called The Nose. Neither have had anything to do with one another, but an actual nose. No, that's in that's in Gogol. This nose gets uh, runs around town and is wearing seen going into church and praying and wearing a general's uniform with epaulets on its nose shoulders. And uh, my my book was uh, you know just the crazy book about a guy who is trying to sell himself as a as the nose <laughs> and I said the nose I, th I thought that it might have been because of your involvement and real connection with the bread and puppet that they had made a nose you know and it ran around town because oh, no, there was a production actually of Gogol's story uh in this uh, theater that was on 273 main uh 273 whatever uh and there were some oh, posters, Pearl yeah, on Pearl Street, and there were some posters of the nose, and they were up a lot of places. But that was that was Gogol's nose. Um, and as far as bread and puppet, 
knows. Um, I'll show you once. Yes. Um, oops. Wow, oh, look nose. at that. That's his nose. And he has a mask. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> I guess, see, like that. Mm. And this is, um, you can't maybe see it, but this fabric is garlic uh, clove, so it keeps away COVID and also vampires. Okay. Well, put that up on screen and, and um, we'll go out with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark and, and Donna. Thank you. Fomite Press, be careful what you wish for. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Goodbye for now. Bye.